Um, this is our own Roger Rosenblatt, the American Essay, uh, Time Magazine, uh, the Lair News Hour, the Writers Program at Southampton College, um, and, and my the, personal assistant. Yeah, that's right, yes. Rod. <laughs> that's true. As a matter of fact, uh, that's the voice of Robert Reeves, who is uh, uh, co-hosting with me these uh, brief uh, introductory moments uh, of each of these evenings. And Bob, what exciting things have happened in the last uh, 24 hours since we heard Mr. E. L. Doctorow last evening? Well, we had uh, this afternoon a wonderful presentation uh, by uh, our conference photographer uh, Chip Cooper, who is a noted photographer, primarily associated with the, the, the southern United States. Uh, he has four books of photography uh, and is primarily a landscape photographer, but he is so good uh, that we gave him a chance to do author portraits, and he displayed the results today in a, in a, a program, and these photographs were absolutely uh, works of art. The authors are thrilled. Uh, we're doing these photographs to have a, a record of uh, of this conference uh, for when we have a new uh, uh, building for our writing program on, on campus, we're going to have this uh, be part of our gallery. So it was a huge success. Uh, and uh, it was our first uh, live broadcast from Duke Lecture Hall on uh, uh, local uh, television, so that was also kind of momentous. Uh, that's, that's really good, and it's part of what we hope is going to be more uh, television uh, working with our friends at LTV. Uh, I'm Wally Smith with Bob Reed. Um, Wally, let me alert uh, the audience to something that uh, is about to happen because I'm going to excuse myself in a moment and approach the podium. We're having a little uh, surprise for uh, Roger tonight, who's so important for the program. Uh, we have a little uh, filmed uh, uh, little uh, prank with uh, Frank McCourt. Your audience won't be able to see it, but uh, when uh, you hear, we're going to uh, shoot on the screen. Uh, Frank McCord is going to be uh, allegedly uh, broadcast live from a remote location, and he will be dressed uh, uh, for the audience as a uh, 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 with a, a French director, film director, uh, with a beret, uh, cigar, and assistants. And uh, I think you'll, uh, it's all uh, you'll hear what he has to say, and you'll get the uh, uh, the point of the joke. It's going to be I think Roger is, is going to be a surprise to Roger, and so it, uh, we're looking forward to it. And I think we're ready to go. Well, you, you need to, I guess. Yeah. Uh, okay, we're going to begin over. now. So I'm going to excuse you myself. You can excuse right. yourself, right? So you we'll, can do a little fundraising. I'll while do, I'm that's right. <laughs> I'll, re I'll give that that number for our concert tonight. At any rate, uh, <laughs> Bob Reeves will be introducing the introducer uh, this evening, and uh, we are uh, in a uh, just a stellar house full of excellent uh, guests this evening. Um, they're always excellent, but we have some very, very notable uh, figures from the East End who are with us tonight, along with uh, the uh, group of authors who have been here. And we're going to uh, be joining uh, Robert Reeves now at the podium. Bob Reeves. It's been a spectacular 10 days. Feels like 10 months. Um, <laughs> And although we have more events planned, uh, this is the last in our series of evening lectures. Uh, and it's appropriate that uh, this evening's speaker be Roger Rosenblatt, uh, to whom we are so grateful and who has been central to the unprecedented success of this conference. But I'm afraid I have to announce a little uh, change in plan. So Roger was not expecting to see me here. He was expecting to see Frank McCourt, who had agreed to introduce him. Uh, now here's the problem. Frank McCourt, big shot writer Frank McCourt, <laughs> last night flew in a jet to the west coast because he said he had an important assignment. He happened to have taken two of our best graduate assistants with him who had been waiting on him hand and foot uh, the entire time. And uh, you heard him the other night, he was complaining, he was whining about his uh, accommodations. And I tell you, I've had it up to here <laughs> with Frank McCourt. <laughs> and I'll tell you why I got a problem with this, because the person I care about is Roger Rosenblatt. Roger Rosenblatt supports us, all of us here, uh, in every way. He stands shoulder to shoulder with us, and we appreciate it. And because we appreciate it, if Roger wants Frank McCourt to introduce him, by God, Frank, Frank McCourt will introduce him. Now, we are going to do something that's never been tried at any conference ever. We have, we have technical experts who've witnessed them all week. They can do anything. We have Harry Barber here, the sound man. Yeah. 
and we have Kimberly Bonsey, who is in charge of media. And in the rear, we have John Bonsey in, in charge of camera stylings. Yeah. And what they've been able to do is arrange a live satellite feed to California. And it just so happens that Chancellor Silliman has a satellite, uh, so we were pleased about that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, here's what we're going to do. This is the cutting edge of uh, conference technology. Uh, and I want to warn you one thing. Now, you saw Frank McCourt, and you saw the modest, charming, witty, former high school teacher. Well, that's an act. <laughs> and what you're about to see, you're going to see, he doesn't even have an Irish accent. So, live, on location from so Southern California, to introduce our evening speaker, please welcome Mr. Frank, I'm famous, you're not, McCoy. <laughs> Good evening, uh, my name is Frank McCourt and um, I'm sorry I can't be with you this evening to introduce Roger um, uh, Rosenblatt. Uh, I'm on uh, a project at the moment, making a film. Uh, it's quite demanding, I thought I could get uh, back but I find that sometimes when I'm shooting uh, there's a change in weather, there's a change in lighting and, uh, and then the script rewriting which I have to do as a director. Um, I have to, I'm responsible for every single moment, every frame. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, uh, so I, I just want to tell you something about Roger uh, uh, Rosenblatt. Uh, he's quite a distinguished essayist and uh, professor and uh, one of the guiding lights of the Southampton, um, uh, Southampton um, uh, writing uh, workshops. I, I'm, uh, thank you very much, thank you. Uh, so I, I, I'm so, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm quite unhappy, but I know Roger mm, will understand because Roger being an adapted, an adaptive and a flexible human being knows that the central event of this evening is not me, who is introducing, thank you very much, is to who is not introducing but Roger himself. He is the main event. He knows that. He always knows that. He was kind enough to ask me to introduce him. Now I, I didn't know that I was going to have this, this uh, project. So I want to wish uh, all of you uh, a good entertaining evening and as I say I'm, I, 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 I'm, I'm so unhappy but perhaps next year if Roger uh, invites me back I'd be glad to introduce him. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, uh, I'm wishing you a very good evening and you, to you Roger, to you Roger uh, have a nice and have a nice eventful amusing and witty evening and perhaps we'll meet later for a glass of uh, the very best wine uh, that Southampton College has to offer. <laughs> Mr. Frank McCart. I'm very sorry that I was, I was, uh, it was a deal, it was a bit, it, it was a deal, I, 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 I just, you can't say no to Hollywood. Uh, I, 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 I met somebody at, 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 um, at the Jones, the Joneses, we were at the Joneses last night and there were all kinds of directors and movie people but um, 
and I had to rush. It was a private jet leaving from MacArthur. Uh, I'm back. And I'm glad I'm back, Roger, because um, uh, I was going to say seriously, but seriously, Roger. I'd never use that word with you, Roger. But uh, uh, I, I'm here to introduce Roger because uh, I, it's because of Roger th that I'm here. And I, I didn't know. Uh, I didn't know about the Writers uh, Conference in Southampton. And I, I've, I've known, I'm aware of Roger over the years as an essayist here, there. You pick up this magazine, you watch that television program, you know about Roger Rosenblatt, and you know he falls into a line of lo a long tradition of essayists from Francis Bacon and Charles Lamb right up, right up to the present. And he is, he, in this world where we like to go all tragic all the time and gloomy because in this country, in our land, great weight is given to great weight. <laughs> on, 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 uh, and there are solemn asses everywhere, and they wear us out. And if you want to deprive yourself of humanity, watch television on a Sunday morning. And they're, 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 there should be a new word called pomposing. Uh, it's, uh, but, but Roger, uh, I, kn I know, uh, I, did you say, I know the man. Of course I know the man. I know the man, and uh, I, I know something of his work, and I know that the way he the way he proceeds through life and the way he writes about life is something. It's some people call it buoyant and unrealistic and too optimistic and the rest of it. But you can't be too buoyant. You can't be too optimistic. This is the way things are. And then he has this comic spirit. And I don't mean comic spirit in the sense of a stand-up comedian. I mean, there's the sense of humor and the sense of absurdity, which boils down, and I don't, uh, or Roger's going to start shifting uneasily in his seat if he's flattered or complimented too much. That's, that's the way. So start shifting, Roger. I don't care. <laughs> shifting uneasily in your seat. Be, uh, because he's, uh, when, I, when, I th when I think of uh, images, I think uh, he's a, com a combination of a Buddha, in, uh, of the, the wisdom of Buddha and the middle way of the Buddha, and the common sense of a, of a Benjamin Franklin, and the humor, although it's not grim, the humor, a cutting humor sometimes, of, of Swift. And I, you when he, he wrote his book about America and re recently where we are, 30 Reasons for Loving America, I would, I would add one more, Roger Rosenblatt. Good night. <laughs> my, my uh, thank you, Frank. My friendship with the great McCourt brings me back to a very happy year that Ginny and I spent in, in Ireland when I was a student, in which we had a wonderful time. And the only serious mishap, this is recalled by McCourt, the only serious mishaps were caused by my name, my name in Ireland. Actually, my name outside of Ireland is encumbering. <laughs> the Rosen is all right. Rosen, roses, pink leaf, redolent of flowers, rose, Rosen. But the blat, <laughs> the blat. When you attach the blat to the Rosen, it sounds like an overripe pumpkin thrown from the roof of a cheap hotel. <laughs> Rosen. Living in Ireland was a test of their acceptance of this name, living in the land of the Siobhans and the Nick O'Houlihans and so forth. I did make the Irish, uh, all Irish basketball team. I was the first, I believe only Rosenblatt ever to, <laughs> to make the team. Most difficult situation occurred at a book auction in, uh, in Marion Square. Um, never been to a book auction before, had never been to an auction before, and Ginny and I went together. It was a grand 19th century hall filled with books, <laughs> lots of books as they were called, not many books, but packs of books. And it was a book that I had always wanted, which was Flann O'Brien's At Swim Two Birds, and there, sure enough, sure enough, there was a lot that had At Swim Two Birds. 
And we hardly had any money at all, but I thought maybe among all the others it wouldn't go noticed, and I made my paltry bid, and I won. I won. And there were numbers on the packets, and down the grand hall, five, six times the size of this room, with the grand ceiling, they asked then the names of the people who had won the bid. And the man at the end of the hall said, name please. Rosenblatt, said I. Deadly silence covers the room. Name, please, again. <laughs> Rosenblatt, I says. More silence. Could you let us have that one more time? <laughs> By this time, I'm getting angry and petulant and aggressive. I see the name rolling out of the Grand Hall, across the Channel, into England, <laughs> Poland, Hungary, Russia, wherever it was my parents came from. Rosenblatt, 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 I say. Dead silence, the auction goes on. At the end of the auction, I go up to pick up my, book, uh, my books on which they had written my name, Frozenwem. <laughs> With two M's. I have kept it to this day. I'm lucky to be assigned the final lecture of this conference, this wonderful conference in which we have been so lucky to be in one another's company. Wonderful, uh, wonderfully lucky to have the opportunity to express my admiration for my predecessors and to correct everything they have said. <laughs> but as Frank didn't say, seriously folks, one of the great pleasures of this conference has been to learn from Billy and Jules and Frank and Bahardi and all, and all, and Clark and all. And now it's my turn to do what they did for you, to inspire and to instruct and to uplift. Well, all good things must come to an end. <laughs> Fact is, I've never been one to persuade or inspire very much. I, I've had trouble with authority, asserting authority most of my life. I have tried, God knows. Years ago, we lived in Vermont. Uh, we rusticated in Vermont. This, as every writer will tell you, is de rigueur. It's the law, actually. All writers must go up to Vermont for a little while. <laughs> and then after they get tired of talking to beavers and small animals, then they, we come back to New York. So we were living in Vermont. And I got a call from Time Magazine. And at first, I thought it was a subscription thing. But then <laughs> the, the, uh, uh, that they wanted me, the editor, Ray Kay, very dour man, it looked like Captain Ahab but without the sense of humor. <laughs> Ray, R Cave calls me and says, I want you to come down and talk about a job writing the essay for Time Magazine. And I, boy, did I want to get in the car right then, but I wanted to show that I had authority, distance. I had some, uh, I wasn't a, 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 a country bumpkin. I wanted to establish something. So I go down there and we talk about the job and he's writing the essay for Time, that's fine. And the salary was fine, 50 bucks, anything. Anything was fine. But again, I wanted to show him I had some gumption, was what I was made of. So I said, well, my voice cracking because I was about to tell a lie. I said, well, <laughs> I'm used to four weeks vacation. Now this was true and not true. At the Washington Post where I had worked previously, I had three weeks vacation. But before that, I taught in a university where I had three months vacation. So I figured the whole thing averaged out. <laughs> well, I'm used to four weeks vacation. I looked at Cave. Cave looked at me. I could tell, he could tell, he was in the presence of a man of authority. <laughs> After just the right beat, he said, well, Roger, we ordinarily start with five weeks. <laughs> but in your case, we'll make an exception. <laughs> and I don't really know much about writing. I, know, I don't even know what I like, as they say about art. Um, I know what I liked 30 years ago. It's not the same thing I like today. What I like today, I didn't like 30 years ago, and vice versa, and vice prosa. Truth is, most of writing is a mystery. We are all mystery writers, but we don't even know who done it. Our mutable moods create different writers, different days. I am Rosenblatt, I am Frozenwim. <laughs> I am certain we are stuck happily stuck, gloriously, joyously stuck with the writing life. The writing life, such as 
It is, it is such a strange life. We are such a strange breed. It is so nice to be together where we can't tell us from the real people, from <laughs> normal, decent people. Ask any of us, ask any writer, how are you? The simple question, how are you? And he thinks, what does he mean by that? <laughs> how are you, meaning since you haven't published anything in five years, I, I assumed you were in prison. And we live off the earth. We live off the earth. Oscar Levant said in a movie, don't blame me, lady, I didn't make the world. I barely live on it. We understand that. We understand it. I have always lived at some remove from reality. It started as a, as a kid. Um, I had uh, once uh, in school, in the sixth grade, the teacher asked uh, the students <laughs> Um, to bring a musical instrument if they had one and, and wished to play to entertain the class. And my aunt, the day before as it happened, happened to give me a guitar. I had never played the guitar a day in my life. But I thought it would kind of come to me. <laughs> I can still see myself sitting in front of my class playing Red River Valley with the one chord that I had learned and thinking somehow it'll all be fine, it'll all work out in their hilarity. Learned movie lines when I was a kid. Used to try to insert movie lines that I knew into normal conversation. You may imagine what a delightful social companion I, I was. People would have me having a decent talk, and I've been waiting for that moment to get in the one line that amused me. One was a line I never got in from the movie Earthquake. You remember the disaster movies of the 1970s? And um, George Murphy played a cop. He always played a cop. And uh, he, uh, there was another guy who was stalking a young woman through the entire movie, wanting to jump her. You would think that an earthquake would be enough to distract such a fellow, but he was ardent and he waited the entire movie to jump this, uh, jump this guy, I uh, jump this girl, and he does at the end. And Murphy grabs him and throws him off and says to the girl, I don't know what it is, earthquakes just bring out the worst in some guys. <laughs> For years, I tried to get that into a normal conversation, <laughs> unsuccessfully. I did, however, get in a line that on the face of it will sound much more difficult, but I was lucky. You remember the Sherlock Holmes movies with um, Nigel Bruce and Basil Rathbone with Bruce playing Watson. And in one movie, Watson, um, Nigel Bruce, wanted to impress some people as to the excellence, the expertise, the genius of Holmes, and mentioned a case that they might have known to indicate how great Holmes was. And what he said was, haven't you ever heard of the giant rat of Sumatra? Haven't you ever heard of the giant rat of Sumatra? Decades passed as I waited for an opportunity to get that into a conversation. <laughs> haven't you ever heard of the giant rat of Sumatra? Then one day when I was working at the Washington Post, some friends and I went out for lunch, and it happened to be the 50th anniversary of Mickey Mouse. And a guy at the table says, has there ever been a bigger rodent? <laughs> the best thing about a writer, as people in this room know, is that we can live according to our own terms, or more, more, live more according to our own terms than most people. We do not have to give what is expected of you, in fact, we deny that generally and purposefully. To write is to say I will live according to my terms, not what others expect of me. If you want me to be serious, I will be frivolous. If you want me to be magnanimous, I will be petty. If you want me to be petty, I will be as generous as Jesus. Gracious, I will be irksome. Ironic, I will be a brazen believer in all, all things. Whatever you wish, I will not give you, unless it is totally by accident the thing that you really need. And even then, I will resent it. We are stuck in the writing life. We are stuck with this predisposition to mutilate sheets of paper and share the pieces. I was watching our granddaughter. I was hypnotized by our granddaughter the last few weeks, 15 months old, walking around the house, taking little pieces of paper, ripping them up, and handing them around. And I thought, another one. <laughs> It all starts with love of language, generally. Love of language. Frank and I were talking about how the Irish language gets into English and, and, and points it up like the bricks of a house. Just how it changes, how it, changes, how it, how it 
lengthens things. There's no, no word for yes or no in Irish. You say, it, I, it, I did, it is, I, saw, um, I was, and so forth, just to keep the sentence going, keep it, keep it longer, let it dwell, dwell on language and the love of language, the malleability of language, what language can do. It's power, it's power. I'm always intrigued by people who wish to ban books, ban us. Always interested in this. Not so much in what they do, but in the explanations they offer for what they do, why they ban specific books. There's a, the children's book, Where's Waldo, which was banned in Springfield, Oregon, for, um, uh, what was it? Um, oh, some, it had something to do with surreal no, uh, Dan, I'll, when, you, when I wish to be helped by you, I certainly will <laughs> indicate it. Um, there, was a, an, another, uh, there was a children's book that gave a morbid portrayal of death. A morbid portrayal of death. I hate it when that happens. Another book called Hitler's Hang-Ups. Well, they wanted to ban Hitler's Hang-Ups about Hitler's sexual oddities. You know, given Hitler's other tendencies, <laughs> you'd think the sexual stuff would be relatively acceptable. <laughs> Still, it's interesting to think about Hitler's hang-up, such a title. Hitler enters the bedroom. Ava Braun says, oh no, my little Fuhrer, not with that you don't. <laughs> and what is more interesting, what is more interesting when language gets botched and twisted and turned around, when reality uh, is revealed through a faux pas, you know, through a false step. In the 1960s, you may remember that Pepsi's slogan in those years was come alive with Pepsi, come alive with Pepsi. This was translated in Germany as come alive out of the grave with Pepsi. <laughs> or alternately, Pepsi brings your ancestors back from the grave. <laughs> now that is a soft drink. So much more intriguing the world of linguistic mishap, the error, the blooper. What does it hide, the blooper? In this book, that Frank, this uh, book Where We Stand, um, Frank was kind enough to mention, there's a riff of an essay. It's not really an essay. It's just a, I use the context in order to riff about our leaders. It's called Our Leaders Say the Darndest Things, and it's about the idea that I sometimes think since every one, every one of the national figures in our lifetime has said something preposterous that we elect them for this purpose, that we elect them in order to laugh at them. Every one, uh, certainly every president in my lifetime has at one time or another sounded nuts. Nixon approaches the Great Wall of China in the company of Secretary of State William Rogers. He turns to the Secretary of State and says, I think you'll have to agree, Mr. Secretary, that this is a great wall. <laughs> goes, to, goes to Paris for the uh, funeral of Pompidou, gets out of the car, says, it's a great day for France. <laughs> I interviewed Nixon a couple of times. The first time, and I was frightened, actually, to do that. First time I interviewed him, I put my tape recorder beside him. He looks at it, he says, oh, that's one of those new tape recorders. They're so much better than the old tape recorders. <laughs> I didn't know if he was kidding. I didn't laugh, I didn't say, oh yes, Mr. President, these don't skip a minute. I did not say that. His successor, Jerry Ford, was a great fellow, really great fellow, nice, n nice uh, fellow. Um, you may remember when he was so excited once he talked about Poland no longer being under <laughs> communist domination, which must have come as great news to, to Poland at the time. <laughs> My favorite remark when asked about whether he still kept up with sports was, I always watch the Detroit Tigers on radio when I can. <laughs> I like the when I can. Some of us remembering, remembering the 60s and the Democratic Convention in Chicago in 1968 remember Mayor Daley saying, the policeman is not here to create disorder, the policeman is here to preserve disorder. <laughs> there was a Senate 
Senator Kenneth Wary from Nebraska, who constantly during that time was referring to Indigo China. <laughs> you have to be in the mood for such a speech. Jimmy Carter, um, uh, wonderful, does wonderful things now, but he too, this must be something about Poland, said at one time, I want to make love to all the people of Poland. <laughs> Luckily, they had been freed by Jerry Ford in order to do that. <laughs> I miss, oh, I miss George Bush, the elder. I'm, the, things he, the things he said. You may remember he was praising Václav Havel, then president of Czechoslovakia, and he wanted to praise him for, quote, living or dying, whatever, for freedom. <laughs> like the whatever. Of the 1988 election, he said, I believe the undecideds could go one way or the other. <laughs> Great stuff, rich stuff. Poor Reagan is in terrible shape now, but people forget the wonderful things that he said. Returning from a trip to South America, he said, you'd be surprised, they're all individual countries. <laughs> sure, sure, sure we've made mistakes, he said, but let's not throw the baby out with the dishes. Actually, the funniest thing I ever heard in public life was said not by Reagan, but in Reagan's presence. Again, this wonderful where language can go. <laughs> Reagan, was <laughs> Reagan was about to give a speech to the uh, Knights of Malta, white tie dinner of the Knights of Malta, very Tony organization, very conservative. And what he was speaking about was his opposition to the abortion laws, quite understandable. And here's how J. Peter Grace introduced Ronald Reagan as he was about to give this speech. Ronald Reagan knows where life begins. Ronald Reagan knows that everyone in the world, every one of you, was at one time a feces. <laughs> poor, poor Grace repeated feces three times in the introduction. Well, who is to say he was wrong? So we've got the words, and the words become a sentence. I've always liked the word sentence. Sentence is a judgment. Sentence is a sentence. I, I'm, I'm, I, 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 I love us when we write a sentence, all of us here, and then we've written the sentence. We don't know where it's going to end when we write it, and then we read it over, and we still don't know where it's going to end. We wrote it ourselves. I do not understand this. You know, we're still just as interested to see, where did that end after all? You know, this wonderful stuff. And sentence as judgment, or um, uh, as, a, as a judgment in a in a trial or after a trial and the language manipulation there where somebody is given life, mean it's meaning it's taken away. We give life, we take it away. Words, 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 words. And then the words and the sentences gather and we have a story to tell, a story to tell. It is now a common theory that babies learn language in order to tell the story that is already in them. Think of this. Story that is already in them and language comes and then they begin to become people, perhaps to become people like us. It makes no difference. We are all the same. They say we're a rational species. Nobody in this room is foolish enough to believe that. But we are a narrative species. We are a narrative species. We are born to tell stories. We are made to tell stories. The wonderful storytellers I see in front of me, Billy Clark, all, made to tell stories. Keep the story going. Keep the story going. Everything that we do is a story. Everything, every walk of life. Medicine is a story. There's a, there's a branch of medicine now called narrative medicine. It's fairly simple. What it is is they don't want to rely entirely on the machines because they know that the narrative that the patient tells of the progress of a disease not only may be more interesting but much more useful to a doctor. I felt this way on Tuesday and that way on Thursday and that way uh, uh, a week ago and so forth. And the therapy is the same. The doctor tells a story back. I will do this to you on Friday and that to you a week from Saturday, and maybe you will start to feel better. A story that ends happily. Who ever heard of such a thing? Stories and stories. Law. The law is a story. Every court case is a competition of stories. It is the story of the prosecutor and the story of the defense attorney. And the jury decides which story they like better. That's as close as we come to the truth. The OJ trial, they simply liked they simply like Johnny Cochran's story better than they like Marsha Clark's story. You remember the Boston Nanny case where 
there was a, uh, the prosecutor told one story and the defense attorney once told one story. The judge didn't like either story, he wrote a story for himself. And so it goes, these, these stories, businesses. Businesses depend on stories. If we were successful doing this, we were unsuccessful doing that, ergo, we will do something else. So in the past, these things occurred, and in the future, that will, this happens, this happens, this happens. The basic structure of a story, of a story. Think of the, what the Enron story must be, or the WorldCom story. First you steal this, and then you steal that, <laughs> and then you rob your own people blind, and so forth. All of this, all of this, and the forms that we've been dealing with for the last 10 days, dealing with, concentrating on, telling each other about, the poem, the essay, the short story, the novel, the play, all our stories. Poem is a story of an emotion. Essay is a story of an idea. Uh, play is a story of people interacting. The uh, novel and, and short story are, of course, perforce. They are uh, stories. As Clark told us, uh, the short story can be the perfect story, the perfect story. But we know better than that somewhere deeply that there is no such thing because of the story we are always telling about ourselves. And we keep telling that story, and we keep telling that story on the faint prayer that we will one day get it right, get the story right. We are driven, driven to do this. In The Perfect Storm, the, the book, not the terrible movie, you remember the, 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 there was a mackerel fisherman in a hurricane, described er, high, er, book, early in the book, and there's a light, a lantern by which uh, he can see. And the ship is going down, and he is going down. There's no question of this, he will die. And in this last moment, he takes out a piece of paper and writes, and writes by the light of this qu quavering lantern, puts it in a bottle, sends it out, who knows, who knows. There was this amazing, amazing book years ago. I don't think I quite have the, 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 the uh, title right, The Butterfly and the Bee, or something like this. But it was about an editor of Elle magazine, who in Paris, a man in his 40s, um, who had a massive stroke, massive stroke. So massive, so debilitating, that the only thing on his entire body that he could control, the only thing he could move, was his left eyelid his left eyelid, and with that eyelid, he signaled an alphabet, and with that alphabet, he wrote a book. Think of this, think of this, how basic this must be to tell the story, to tell the story we are in us, the, the, that is within us, the, the residents of the Warsaw Ghetto approaching the end, approaching the end, having seen all the others taken away to extermination camps, and the others starving, and the others dying of disease around them, still and yet wrote little notes and rolled them in scrolls and put them in the crevices of the walls, little poems, little fragments of autobiography, anything. Why? Why? To them who had no knowledge of the outside world, the Nazis had inherited the earth. If anybody found these fragments in the walls, they would open these things and laugh at them, deride them, and still, and still. They had to do it, like a biological fact in them. They had to do it. They had to to tell, to write. Canterbury, Canterbury pilgrims go one way, tell some stories, go another way, tell some stories, pass the time. That way the ancient mariner, crazy as a loon, grabs, grabs somebody walking by, and says, I got to tell you this story. Here's a story that I really have to, have to tell you. Job, the book of Job. Messenger in the book of Job says at the end, and I only alone am left to tell thee. And I only alone am left to tell thee. That's the whole end of the story. Now, to be sure, we didn't need only and alone in the same sentence, <laughs> but it's fun to edit the Bible. <laughs> I only alone am left to tell thee, basically the same message of Moby Dick, Moby Dick, Moby Duck. <laughs> Actually, that would be a more interesting. See, I love this stuff. Instead of a whale, have a giant duck in pursuit of the ship. God knows what Billy or Frank or the rest of us could do with that. Moby Duck. I'll start it if somebody will finish it. I alone am left to tell the tale, says Ishmael. I, am alone, I alone am left to tell the tale. That's the whole business of this. 
None of this really matters as much as my telling you about it. You know? All of these things and the words that float in this room in the minds of all you wonderful people. All the time. All the time. And we tell the stories of ourselves. We who write give life form. Billy said something wonderful uh, to me about a week ago. And I said, I'd like to steal it. He said, I guess you already have. This will be the last time you hear it attributed to Billy. <laughs> he said something wonderful. He said that, that form is, is the important thing. He talked about a poem specifically here. To rescue, to rescue people from the despair of the content. Somebody was assaulting him, saying, why is writing so miserable? Why is it so unhappy all the time? And his response was, yes, the, the subject matter is unhappy and miserable. But the form rescues it. The form raises it. The form gives it, gives it life. I must tell you, one of, the, one of the sadder but more beautiful experiences of participating in this conference was to learn from more than a few people here how hard lives have been. One always learns this, but we are in a concentrated situation. And I must tell you, the, the lovely courage of the people with whom I talk, given the circumstances with which they struggled, will bring you to your knees or make you stand up and salute when, and cheer. And then we talked about, we actually talked about this in class today, when those things hit, when cancer hits, when divorce hits, when death hits, when disease hits, when all the things to which we are available hit, knock us left and right. What do we have as writers but the form? What do we have as writers? But to put this in a shape that says, I can deal with this. I can get by this. More than that, I love you enough to give it to you. It's not just for me. It is for you. It is for all of us. And so the form carries. It is the message in the bottle. It is the poem, the play, the, the essay, the memoir. And on and on. Shelley said something wonderful. We must learn to imagine what we know. We must learn to imagine what we know. This is what we do. We know this about our lives. We saw this. We heard that. And then we apply something beyond that to turn it into art, to make it as beautiful, as tolerable, as wonderful as we can. I'll read three essays tonight. The first was written a few years ago. It'll appear in a new collection next sp uh, spring, a mixture of former essays and mostly new ones. This will be a book about essays close to home, about family and friends and so forth. And this one is about my mother's death, which occurred a few years ago. Uh, my mother had Alzheimer's. Some of the references you'll see are dated, but I hope they don't get in the way. This essay is called Takes Your Breath Away. My mother died last week, seven, 17 years too late, of Alzheimer's disease, though not technically, of course. Technically, Alzheimer's victims die of heart failure, pneumonia, perhaps a stroke since the symptoms of the disease and a series of strokes are indistinguishable. My mother died of some respiratory thing, technically. It might be said that she died because she stopped breathing. Now I would like to start breathing again myself, having held my breath for 17 years. Yet oddly, I am wondering what to do with spring this year, oddly because I had been thinking about my mother less and less as her condition deteriorated and as she grew less and less herself. A mighty impressive disease, Alzheimer's. It takes your breath away, first as it inflicts progressive shocks on the victim's system and then in the victim's relatives and loved ones as it deadens feeling altogether. Such fascinating stages. Initially, there is a kind of troubled yet sweet awareness that the clock of the patient's mind is a few seconds off. Then an encroaching recognition of loss of function becomes less recognition and greater loss. Soon words and phrases are looped, like mad lines from a postmodern play. Then Tourette's-like bursts, frags, some incomprehensible, some vile. Then less of that, less of everything until the mind is concentrated down to a curious stare. Even in death, my mother's face looked worried. Dead now, dead for years. 
I ought not to think about her. I should be thinking of China and the returned air crew of the spy plane. I should be thinking about the Cincinnati riots. There's Tiger Woods to think about and the start of the baseball season. Pedro versus Clemens up in Boston, the weekend of my mother's death. I watched, half watched. I should be thinking of spring and April, T.S. Eliot, Columbine, Hitler, Shakespeare, Waco, Taxes, Oklahoma City, Jesus, Moses, Al Jolson singing April Showers. My mother used to sing that. She was born on April 1st. No fooling. But I am not really thinking about her either. I am thinking about not thinking about her and feeling neither guilt nor responsibility. Now, here's a feat for Alzheimer's. It takes guilt away from a Jew. If I converted to Catholicism, would I get some back? <laughs> I do not feel guilty about my mother. I did my filial duties lovingly for the most part. I do not feel responsible. Alzheimer's drops in from nowhere like a mistimed curtain. You don't catch it because you went outside in winter without a hat. Trouble is, I don't feel anything, save the shadows of memories, and e even they have to be reconstructed willfully. One day when the disease was new, I took my mother to lunch and remarked over coffee that we should do this again very soon. Yes, said my mother, but the next time we have lunch, we should invite Joseph Cotton. <laughs> she spoke with dire earnestness. Why, Mom, I asked, since neither of us knew the actor personally. Because Joseph Cotton is remarkable, she said. He can listen to your dialect and know exactly what part of the country you come from. Getting into the spirit of things, I realized that she was thinking of either Leslie Howard or Rex Harrison, both of whom played Shaw's Professor Higgins, and I suggested as much to her. She considered a moment, then smiled in a kind of gentle acknowledgement of the correction and of the craziness of the thought in the first place. Yes, that's right, I was thinking of Rex Harrison. But as long as we've already invited Joseph Cotton, <laughs> I don't think we should renege. That story used to amuse me. The thing about Alzheimer's is that it, it lasts long enough. It takes away everything, not only by erasing the person you once knew, but by erasing the you you knew too, leaving two carcasses. When the disease started getting bad, I used to tell myself that while I could make neither head nor tail of my mother's ravings, still she might have been clear as daylight to herself. When she caved into silence, I told myself she might be harboring pleasant, unexpressed thoughts. Eventually, I stopped kidding myself. What I saw of her was what I got, a blank stone in a wall eaten away by rain, which is very much the way I feel now. The people around Alzheimer's victims suffer from secondhand smoke, and the worst of their secondary disease is that after the long years, the one thought, the one plea that overtakes all others, all the resurrected laughter, the walks along the beach in Chatham on Cape Cod, the brassy imitation of Mae West's strut, the home-sewn Dracula costume at Halloween, the bewildered attendance at basketball games, the singing of April showers, is die. And so she did and it is spring. And because hope breathes eternal, even if nothing else does, I am wondering if my mother is somewhere up and about, breathing again, where life is restored, and the air and the mind are free. That Joseph Cotton anecdote occurred in the Gramercy Park Hotel, and I grew up in the Gramercy Park neighborhood of New York, which is a wonderful place for a writer to grow up. First of all, because it's so enclosed and so privileged, you can't wait to get out of the thing. So there is all that. But it's also a neighborhood full of eccentrics and, the, and, and ghosts. You, know, you have Melville's ghost and, and Stephen Crane's ghost, Edith Wharton's ghost, oh, Henry's ghost just moving around the place. So you're in very, very good company. And, the, 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 the oddity of the way people behaved, I'm not sure it's not, it, it, it's, it, genteel poverty, which never, you know, which went out of fashion because, the, it, it, because people were too cruel, but then it was not so. You didn't have to be rich there. You just have to be weird, you know, to live in the neighborhood. There was a minister of the Calvary Church, a fellow named Stephen Garmey, who I always liked very much, and he used to do wood sculpture. And, uh, um, the, uh, and one day he was in the, park and he took a chunk of wood from a tree, took it home, and then he called me. He said, I'm worried, I'm worried, I'm not feeling well. I said, what's the matter? He says, I think I have Dutch elm disease. <laughs> he meant it. 
We all went to the same school, a little friend's Quaker school four, four blocks uh, downtown, in which the teaching was unusual. We had a biology teacher named Slater who taught us that if a fat man married a thin woman, they'd have an ordinary sized child. <laughs> which is only slightly superior to Arthur Schlesinger, Jr., who went to school at the Agassiz School in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and was taken out of the school by his parents when he came home one day to report that he had learned that an albino was a white Albanian. <laughs> anyway, the next of these essays is about the neighborhood or an institution in the neighborhood. It is possibly the best known of my pieces, uh, requested at readings because it is thoroughly ridiculous. The, the, um, I remember watching Harry Belafonte once on stage, and uh, here's Belafonte, the most just gloriously talented man who could just sing beautifully with uh, every song, any song that was ever written, and what do they do? Deo, sing Deo, <laughs> sing Deo. So that's what I get with this, <laughs> this essay. The comparison ends only at this particular analogy. <laughs> that's what I get with this essay called New Year's at Luchow's. Sing Luchow's, sing Luchow's. Loo is a loo, 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 loo chows. It's about my brother and me and a little bit of luck. Loo chows is a famous old German restaurant in downtown New York. This is when it was. Situate, by the way, the, to this essay is attributed the demise of Loo chows. People in, that insist that when they read this essay that shortly afterwards it went out of business. <laughs> Such is the power that we wield. Luchow's is a famous German, old German restaurant in downtown New York, situated just about where Irving Place and 14th Street make a tea. It jiggles and bustles all year long, but especially at Christmas time, when the proprietors prop up a huge Christmas tree for all to ogle, and a hefty group called the Umpa band toots O Tannenbaum as the customers lustily sing. Diamond Jim Brady proposed to Lillian Russell in Luchow's, offering her a suitcase filled with one million dollars if she'd consent. She did not. That's the kind of place Luchow's was, still is, as far as I know. My parents used to take my brother and me to Luchow's every so often, even though my father suspected the restaurant of having been a Nazi hangout during the war. <laughs> there we went, nonetheless, to stuff our faces and gape at celebrities. I saw Jackie Gleason there once, looking like the comic's little king, leading a retinue including Jack Lascouli of mellow memory among the crowded tables. That was not on New Year's Day. My family never went anywhere on New Year's Day, though for two years running, my brother and I, while never going anywhere, still managed to spend the day at Luchow's. You see, when my brother was in high school, he acquired his own telephone, the number of which was but one digit removed from that of the famous German eatery. At first he was annoyed by this coincidence as calls for Luchaus and calls for my brother came in at a ratio of 20 to 1. <laughs> so eventually, tiring of the phrase wrong number, he began to accept a few reservations. <laughs> this was a cruel prank, to be sure, but partly justified in his and later in my own mind for our being on the receiving end rather than the phoning end of the calls. Returning from graduate school on Christmas vacation, I was delighted to discover my brother's new enterprise and immediately joined his restaurant business with the hall, the high spirits of the season. <laughs> Embellishing his practice of taking reservations straight, I would ask whenever, one, whenever anyone called requesting a table for eight, for example, if the caller also wanted, to, wanted chairs. <laughs> In no instance, and there were dozens, did the reservation makers treat my question as odd. <laughs> as long as they thought they had Luchow's on the phone, everything was Jake. During spring vacation, we adorned our business further by adding a touch of professionalism. Because of frequent requests for the Luchow's head waiter, we learned that the man's name was Julius, Julius, which my brother, for reasons of his own, insistent, insisted on translating as Julio, <laughs> and which name he adopted whenever a call came in. I would answer the phone, transfer the call to Julio, who would do most of the talking in a Spanish-German accent, so difficult to penetrate, that requests for tables and chairs often took 10 minutes. <laughs> we then began to push things a bit, in part to test the limits of human credulity. We asked people if they wished to be seated in the Himmler room. <laughs> 
or if they wanted to try our special Luftwaffels instead of, <laughs> instead of rolls. We asked if they would care to try Luchau's blitzes. These, we explained, were blintzes dropped on one's plate from a great height. <laughs> there were long pauses at the other end of the line when we would ask such things, but the answers when they arrived were always polite and sincere. Once we asked a fellow if he'd mind taking a table for three instead of four, one of his party could eat elsewhere and they could all regroup for coffee. <laughs> He declined the suggestion, but he considered it. <laughs> Our best customers were big shots who presumed a favored relationship with the restaurant. These customers made their reservations in barks. Julius, Mr. Van Camp, for two tonight, yeah. Whenever Julio would hear such talk, he would warm up the tone immediately, keeping Van Camp on the line for interminable periods, as he, Julio, confessed his deepest, most intimate problems to his personal customer. <laughs> After a while, Julio would lead round to the fact that he was broke. Perhaps Mr. Van Camp could see fit to make Julio a gift of $500 as a token of their long, close friendship. No, in that case, there was no table for Mr. Van Camp. <laughs> as these transactions continued over the summer, my brother and I became more than a little ashamed of the havoc we thought we were causing. In fact, it was probably minimal since we'd cracked up at the end of most conversations. We did not stop altogether, however, until the following Christmas vacation, when we started asking people if they would mind being seated on the roof where we had set up a cold buffet. <laughs> it was late December, temperatures often fell below zero when it wasn't snowing. Still, there were one or two takers for our rooftop seats. Though that was not the event that persuaded us to give up the restaurant business. That event occurred on New Year's Day itself, when a sugar-voiced lady phoned in the morning to cancel her reservation for lunch. Julio was furious. <laughs> How are we supposed to run a restaurant, he told her, if everyone called up to cancel reservations? No, madam, it was impossible. <laughs> Under no circumstances could we accept her cancellation. When the woman apologized and started to change her mind, we knew it was time to close shop. <laughs> Finally, this last essay from my latest book. Ah. <laughs> Lou is a Lou is a Lou. Here's the last essay from this most recent book, Where We Stand, 30 Reasons for Love in Our Country, in which I kid around some of the time, serious to others. Um, it's a more sober title than I ordinarily prefer, but frankly, I was scared something else would happen. I didn't want to kid around in an atmosphere of real fear or real sorrow, so I'd rather take the heat and have a dull title and um, uh, not risk uh, doing something that might be offensive and, and hurting and so forth. But my love of country, while often qualified and critical, is genuine. So I will close with this piece, which is called and it's centered in this area, so you will recognize the feeling, if not the exact sites. We, it's called, We Have an Enormous Inventory, or What is This Thing Called, Love? Driving on the highway, I am stuck behind a black delivery truck from East Coast Custom Car. On the back of the truck, in bright yellow lettering, is a list of things sold at East Coast Custom Car. Stereos, alarm systems, bed liners, 4x4 accessories, trailer hitches, fog lights, wheels, and so much more. I make a note to include these items in my accounts, then turn off toward the bay, which is winter blue already. The power boats have disappeared. The cormorants swim in a black mass near the mouth of a creek, their snake heads craning for invisible fish. I watch for a while, slip in a tape of Katie Lang, and add these things to my list as well. Then I drive home where I make more entries still. In the mail are new pictures of the children. I share a cup of hot chocolate with a dog. The wind kicks up. The fat pine on the front lawn trembles its skirts in the late afternoon. Shadows smudge the hedges. Day hook slides into night. I think of high school baseball and basketball. The orange moon hangs so low it looks as if it is about to fall to earth and bounce. Here I go again. I am always doing this. Taking an inventory of the country, a half-aware accounting that totals up as a feeling of certain, if irrational, affection, a stream of unconsciousness. 
There's no hard evidence in this list, no passage of a just law, no moment of national courage or generosity, nothing that would stand up in court as a reason for loving the place. Images and memories, mostly. This inventory is getting out of hand. Last week alone, I made more than a thousand new entries, and I never erased the old ones. If this keeps up, I will require a dozen ledgers, and even then my accounts will come up short. Saw a full-sized antlered stag the other day at dusk as I was walking down the main street of my Long Island village. Suddenly he stepped out of the driveway, looked ready to panic, saw it was only me, and trotted head high down the center of the street. I put him on the same page as Cole Porter, why not? Who constitutes a huge part of my love of country. Play in the still of the night and I drop to my knees the heartache of the internal rhymes of the last lines like the moon growing dim on the rim of a hill in the chill still of the night. As long as I am hearing things, I'll add Ella always and Louie, especially when they're singing together, and Joe Cocker and Sarah Vaughan and Frank. I first heard Sinatra on radio. Radio. Fred Allen, Jack Benny, Bob and Ray. One morning, Bob and Ray were creating slogans for license, plate and spl license plates and came up with this one, Kansas, the gateway to Nebraska. <laughs> Curled up on the living room rug, I used to listen to the shadow. In one episode, they had to indicate that some time had passed between scenes. Well, Margo, said Lamont Cranston to his companion, here it is the next day. <laughs> I taste A&W root beer. I bite into a double cheeseburger with a holster of fries. How do I get taste into my inventory? I'm at my first baseball game. When I was six, the mother of one of the neighborhood kids took a bunch of us to Yankee Stadium. Joe DiMaggio hit a home run to the opposite field, to the right field stands where we were sitting. A home run by Joe DiMaggio in your very first game, said my friend's mom. You'll never forget that. Which takes me to games of catch with my own kids. I have plenty of entries on that. The American game of catch, so un-American in a way, so calm and uncompetitive. They do not call it a game of throw, though throwing is half the equation. The name of the game puts the burden on the one who receives, but there's really no game to it. Nobody wins or loses. A ball travels between two people, each seeking a moment of understanding from the other across the yard and the years. Which brings me to a page on playground basketball in New York in the summers when I was a teenager, loping along the whited sidewalks that glinted with mica in the sun, the total silence of the early morning, save for the brief musical echo of the ball which takes me to a farmhouse we bought in New Hampshire, our first house, $21,000 for 60 acres and no water. The local guy with a backhoe leveled a basketball court for me. He asked me if I knew the professor down the road. He's like you, he said, doesn't work. <laughs> in Los Alamos, I met a young woman who made nuclear missiles. In Brooklyn, I met a man who made the linings of tunnels. In Norwich, Vermont, I met a calligrapher to whom I gave a beat-up flexible flyer and asked him to write Rosenbud on top of the sled. <laughs> he didn't get the bad joke, kept asking me if I was spelling my name right. <laughs> Citizen Kane, the Maltese Falcon, foreign correspondent, the great last words of foreign correspondent, hang on to your lights, America. They're the only lights left in the world. Met a prisoner in Attica, one Cy Jackson, African-American, exactly my age then, 41. We sat at opposite ends of his, cot, of, the cot, of his cot in his cell, and he told me of a career that started out with a disturbing the peace charge when he banged on his girlfriend's door that led to hitting a cop, that led to more jail time, that led to more fights in prison, and then parole until he was caught with a gun and sent back to Attica all those years in prison. On his cell, he had copied out the poem Invictus. He wrote one of his own. You imagine what you desire, you will what you imagine, you create what you will. Funny people. Years ago when I was writing a column for the Washington Post, a wonderful tough old school journalist named Howard Simons was managing editor. One morning we were in the men's room standing urinal to urinal and I asked him, Howard, why is it that one pronounces the N in the word columnist but not in the word column? Why isn't it columnist? Howard sighed. Roger, he said, I wish I had your problems. <laughs> Lovely people, strong people. 
Sister Mary Paul of the Center for Family Life in Sunset Park, Brooklyn. She and Sister Geraldine worked a lifetime to serve the needs of the poor neighborhood. She told me, people call us a charity organization. I don't like the word charity except in the sense of caritas, love. Love is not based on marking people up by their assets and virtues. Love is based on the sense of the mystery of the person. Here we have the privilege of meeting people in via, as it is said, on the way. They're on a journey. The gratitude I feel is that I am able to see this particular person at this particular time. Yet the person remains an unfathomable mystery and is going somewhere I will never know. Getting late. Got to stop. How am I going to get all this in? I should hire an accountant. The moon is sky high now, a small pale eye at the top of the night. A plane blinks by overhead. Fearful thoughts come with planes these days. Still and always, gratitude to the great unwieldy country for the sublime mess, for the dignity and the courage, for the strange sweetness of our people and the wildness and the pluck for baseball and satchmo and groucho and trailer hitches and oceans and alarm systems and hot chocolate and dogs and so much more. Thank you. Be pleased to answer questions. No math. <laughs> or just thoughts. I know this group. This is a lie. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Ma'am. Uh, um, I'm sure you've become very successful over the years with all of your wonderful writings. I was wondering, why do you bother to teach? So this is oh, that's a nice question. And that, that question we sh I, I share. I, I, I feel with some confidence that, at least in part, though less, um, less ably, I can answer that from my colleagues. Why do writers teach? Why do we bother to do it? Uh, for one thing, we can't stand not being in the house that much. It is a basic thing. We, we really can't. I mean, uh, we drive our mates crazy. We drive ourselves crazy. It is, it is, it is a crazy life. So is, there is the basic. That is the selfish thing. The selfless thing is that writing is very, as we know, uh, inward oriented. Uh, what are you thinking now? What are you feeling? What is the word that you can come up with best? What's the greatest sentence? What is the wonderful thing that you can write? Aren't you great? Teaching can't be that. Teaching done right is what can I give you? What do you need? How can I help you? And this as a kind of emotional or moral balance in our lives is indispensable. So teaching and writing, I've often gone together. Look at McCourt here. Look at McCourt. Uh, teaching all those years. Teaching well, gladly, all those years. Everybody, everybody who taught a workshop here anyway is a practice teacher, is a, pra is a practice teacher. And then this wonderful book kind of putting itself together, hiding in corners, running outside, uh, being hidden in drawers. And then, bang, you know, after any number of years, the teacher becomes the writer. The writer never stopped becoming uh, the teacher. These wonderful people whom we have met this week, whom I'm looking at now with such affection and admiration, all love you. They want you to be better. The only reason that we do it at all is to say, uh, you will move from here to here to here, and we will stand back and stand back and applaud, uh, applaud you. Watch you rise, watch you rise like a comet, rise like a star, rise like a rocket. And uh, um, that is very good for the soul. You know? It's not bad for writing either, actually. You, know, you go out and you come back. You go out and you come back. It's nice rhythm. But Well, maybe I'll get out of here safe then. Thank you so much. And we're enjoying Roger Rosenblatt, the last of the guest lecturers in the 2002 Writers' Conference.